So it's the same title slide as last year, but the rest of the talk's different. Um, I was sitting around trying to figure out what I could come up with that would be a cooler looking title slide than this, and I gave up. Um, so out of curiosity, how many of you heard my talk in Melbourne last year? Cool. That's excellent, because um, this is sort of the, uh, the follow-on part two, generalizing things a little bit. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you have never heard me talk about anything before? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, cool. Um, so this is the, the who is B-Dale thing. I suspect that most of you probably figured at least some of this out by now. Um, I've been doing this open source thing for a very long time. Um, a lot of that's been in Debian space. I'm privileged to have spent the last few years helping HP to try and do the right things. And um, I always put on the bottom, and a lot of times I get strange looks from people about the whole amateur satellite and high-powered model rocketry thing. Of course, I guess today's edition would be. <laughs> <laughs> Except as those of you who were here a few minutes ago may have seen, my wife's already begging me to grow it back. So, <clears throat> Okay, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to give you a quick brief uh, a reintroduction to the whole model rocketry hobby, particularly for those of you who haven't seen me talk about this before. And the things I really want to talk about today are the different ways in which this whole hobby has turned out to be another instance proof of the assertion that Bdale's main hobby is turning all of his other hobbies into open source projects. Um, <clears throat> and if you hang on to the end, um, I will show you um, the video of the flight of my successful level three high power certification which happened in November, which I'm kind of stoked about still. Okay, so what's the basic idea? Well, we like to build, launch, and <laughs> really like to successfully recover um, <clears throat> hobby-sized models of rockets. There's a whole bunch of things that make this an interesting hobby to me. Probably the most significant, really, are that it's been an incredibly cool thing to do with my 10-year-old son. Um, he's totally stoked about the hobby. Um, you'll see some photos of him and his rockets at various points in the talk. Um, it also has been a wonderful opportunity for me to combine bunches of different things that I'm interested in as hobbies. Um, this year, it's particularly included uh, my interest in computer-controlled uh, machining and electronic design and, and you know, embedded software and all these sorts of things. Um, but what ends up happening is when you go beyond sort of the basics in the rocketry hobby, you very quickly find yourself playing with electronics. And once you do that, that's when this whole thing sort of comes back to potentially having an open source element. Um, just to help set a little bit of context, while there are many different axes that we could choose to talk about sort of progressive competency and uh, technical uh, difficulty within the hobby, the thing that almost everybody talks about is how big is the motor. <clears throat> um, I, it probably has something to do with sort of the, the visceral rush. It also has a lot to do with the cost. Um, and I, as I explained last year, there are sort of three levels of certification in the uh, high-powered motor uh, sequence. Fundamentally, the only things you really need to understand are that each letter prefix on the motor class is a doubling of total performance from the previous class. Um, and the other thing is that there is this sort of category of research rocketry where you go above, beyond, or take a, a left turn to the weird from the whole commercial motor categorization process. We still talk about them with letter prefixes and so on, but uh, making homemade motors is where all of a sudden this goes from a relatively safe, relatively straightforward, you know, dial your willingness to spend money kind of hobby into something that's, you know, pleasantly more dangerous. <laughs> so just to give you an idea, this is an old photo of what my son likes to call the family portrait. Uh, this is uh, lots of little rockets, uh, SD size kits and so forth. The largest one in this photo, the yellow, red, and black rocket, is the one that I successfully um, achieved the level one and level two certifications with. That one's a 98 millimeter inside diameter airframe tube, I don't know, a meter and a quarter or something long. So that gives you a general sense of scale on some of those. So I talked a little bit about you know, the fact that you always seem to end up playing with electronics. Well, <clears throat> one of the issues is how do you control the deployment of the recovery system? In this case, I mean parachutes or streamers, that sort of thing. 
Um, if you've ever played with Estes size model rockets, they actually have a little black powder charge at the front of the motor and a little delay element between the propellant and the ejection charge. So the motor burns and then it burns through this little stuff that takes a while. That's why it's called a delay. And then it ignites this little black powder charge, which you know generates a puff of gas, pops the nose cone off, the parachute comes out, the rocket comes back. It's a lot of fun. Well, the problem is when you start building bigger and more sophisticated rockets, two things happen. One is it's actually very difficult to predict what the exact amount of time is going to be between the end of the motor burn and when you achieve maximum altitude with the rocket. And the second thing is that the consequences of ejecting the uh, parachutes at something other than the minimum velocity, which you get as you go over the top at Apogee, um, goes up. You have a lot more mass in these larger rockets. Um, they're potentially moving at higher speeds, and there's a lot of force involved when a fast-moving thing all of a sudden becomes non-aerodynamic and tries to flip itself around. And there's this phenomenon called a zipper, where the shock cord that the parachute's attached to sort of rips down through the side of the airframe tube because of the force involved in all the pieces trying to change directions at high speeds. So what, what we often find ourselves doing is wanting to use electronically controlled um, recovery system ejection events. Um, and you know, this is just sort of you know, the thing that causes the whole avionics thing to be a really big deal in the rocketry hobby. There's all sorts of other things that go on. Um, it is genuinely a lot of fun to collect even really simple data. Uh, my son, I'll show you the little Pico alt altimeter here in just a second, but it's a tiny little altimeter board that just has an 8-pin microcontroller, a barometric pressure sensor, and an LED on it. And with that, you can successfully uh, determine approximately what the maximum altitude of the flight was. Well, for my now 10-year-old son, the fact that all of a sudden it's not just you know burning a motor and watching a rocket go up and back down, but he can actually keep track of how high did it go, and if we fly a different kind of motor, what does that do to the altitude, and you know, what happens if we try it in a different rocket that has a different fin geometry or a you know, different size body tube or something like that. <clears throat> and this really does convert it from just sort of the visceral rush into something that starts to sound like science. And I think that's pretty cool and pretty important. And this is what that little thing looks like. There's a tip of a pencil for scale over to the right. I don't know how, from here, the color on the screen is not all that great. I hope it's better for you guys. So the other thing that happens when you do electronic deployment is you can do something called dual deploy, where you have a recovery system event at Apogee where you put out a little drogue parachute or a streamer or something, which keeps the rocket from going sort of to the full ballistic return speed. Um, but at the same time, allows it to come down fast enough that it doesn't have time to be blown by the high-level winds too far away from you as it's coming down. And then using a barometric altimeter that's measuring the air pressure, we can preset the altitude above ground where we would like it to then uh, engage a second ejection event um, that puts out the main parachute and slows it down enough that it can touch down without too much damage. Um, this rocket is a 75 millimeter inside diameter tube. I don't know, it's three-ish meters long, I guess. Um, this one I flew last May at an event in the Pawnee National Grasslands in northeastern Colorado. The uh, rocketry club in, in that part of the world runs two major uh, multi-day launch events. The one in May is called Mile High Mayhem. The uh, launch field is actually, as is Denver, somewhat south of there, almost exactly one mile in elevation above sea level. Uh, so it's fun to fly in Colorado because you're starting at sort of higher altitude. There's slightly thinner air, less resistance. We get higher altitudes on some of our flights as a consequence. But you can see this one went to, you know, 4351 meters. And yes, you know, thank you, Google. I did successfully go through and translate units for those of you that are a little, you know, English system challenge. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things I learned with this flight is even though it was an absolutely gorgeous day, and I was able to watch the rocket all the way through the flight. I was able to see the puff of uh, smoke as the ejection event happened at Apogee and so forth. I would not have found this rocket again if it had not had an RF beacon in it. Because even though that's a short grass prairie, um, 
once this thing had set itself down in the prairie about you know, a mile and a half, two and a half clicks down range, I had to be within about 100 meters of it before I could see it. And as a consequence, I learned sort of through this process the value of having, you know, RF tracking stuff. Remember that. By the way, that's the motor that went into that thing. This is an L-class motor. That's a 54 millimeter outside diameter motor casing, however long that is, totally chock-a-block full of propellant. And this is the dual deploy altimeter that we flew in that particular rocket. Um, this is a very simple and straightforward device. It's one of the cheapest dual deployment capable altimeters that's on the commercial market. It sells for about $80 US. Um, and fundamentally, all it will do is record the peak altitude, the peak velocity, which is really amusing when it tries to tell you that after you've busted Mach. Um, <clears throat> and it's capable of controlling two ejection events. In effect, putting an electric charge through an electric match to ignite a black powder charge or something like that. A uh, very popular um, altimeter model. I will tell you later why I don't love them so much anymore. So, okay, you know, a lot of things, in, including that rocket that I flew for the very high altitude flight, a lot of this is done by building things from kits. And, you know, building kits is fun, but making custom stuff is just so much more fun. And for me in particular, this is where I really started combining hobbies. And uh, in the last year, I've written quite a bit of Python to emit G-code, which is the assembly language of computer-controlled uh, machining. And yes, I have a milling machine, and I've had fun using it to cut things like the centering rings that center up the motor mount tubes inside the airframe tubes, um, and to cut the blanks for fins that I was going to do composite construction on and so forth. Um, I'll show you a photo of my little mill in operation. It's kind of cute, tabletop sort of thing, but it's hideously proprietary. It has a DOS-based program that does direct synthesis of the stepper motor drive signals out bits of the parallel port. And as a consequence, you can't have any of the old DOS terminate and stay resident stuff running, or it messes up the timing and, and causes it to lose steps and all of this. So I have to use a really old computer that doesn't have a network interface or any of the associated drivers, basically nothing that will generate an interrupt while the program's running, or you know it doesn't make good parts. Um, so the combination of that and the fact that I'd really like to be able to make bigger parts than I can do with this little mill means that I'm now working on CNC conversion of a big milling machine. I'll show you a photo of that in just a minute. This is another one of those things that may well end up being the subject of a talk proposal at some point because this milling machine, including the am amplifier hardware to drive the servo motors and all, is a completely open design. And then the other thing I've been playing with quite a bit is doing custom carbon fiber uh, components. It turns out that there's this cute little vacuum bagging thing that they sell for, you know, leftover meals uh, to be preserved in the kitchen called a food saver. And the bagging material for that works just fine to vacuum bag carbon fiber composites. And I'll show you some photos of that in a second. So here's the little milling machine cutting a centering ring. This one would have been for a 98 millimeter uh, too. In fact, this is from my first level three attempt rocket. A couple of features that are interesting here. You notice that in addition to sort of cutting the inside and outside radius of the ring, there's some notches cut in it. I learned very quickly when I started playing with the milling machine that there was no reason not to cut fin alignment slots like that. When you go to put the rocket together, you glue the fins in and it sort of automatically aligns them and holds them, you know, perfectly aligned. If you've ever built an Estes rocket or something, one of the fiddly bits is trying to get the fins aligned right. And uh, Keith, who was present at the time that I flew this particular rocket, will tell you that it did really go straight up. Um, I'm very proud of that. Unfortunately, I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute. <laughs> so this is the slightly larger milling machine. <coughs> um, I don't know how to explain this very well, except that the one I have now has a total working area, and pardon me for the use of the English units, but I, it's got about a 12 inch uh, X capability, about five inches in Y and about three inches in Z. This one is 30 inches in X, 12 inches in Y, and 17 inches in Z. So I can do like really big parts. <coughs> and you know, it's a Chinese made 
bed mill. I'm to the point now where all of the lead screws and so forth have been removed and replaced with high precision ball screws. And uh, it's, you know, I've built the stand, actually my daughter helped me weld up the stand that this will sit on. And hopefully another two or three months this will be online and, and making parts in the basement. Okay, so I talked about the carbon fiber stuff. Um, if this looks a little fuzzy, it's because that's actually inside a bag. That's two pieces of three millimeter thick plywood, um, birch uh, plywood, that are sandwiching a piece of carbon fiber, which comes as sort of a flexible fabric. And once you soak it with epoxy and put it between these two pieces of plywood and you stick it in the vacuum bag and suck it all down, all the excess epoxy gets squished out and what you're left with is the optimal amount of epoxy to glue all of this together and make it really strong. But then of course, you know, um, one layer of carbon fiber is never enough. So this is the final composite vacuum bag. And what's going on here is that I've got a total of seven layers of material. It's a sheet of um, fiberglass that will give me a sanding surface so I can make the outside of it really smooth. So it's fiberglass, carbon fiber, plywood, carbon fiber, plywood, carbon fiber, fiberglass. And then when I bag it like this, there are two additional layers on each side. One is a porous nylon material that the epoxy can soak out through that we call a peel ply so that once the epoxy's dry and cured, you can peel that back and you're left with a gloriously smooth finish. And then the outside of that is a piece of sort of cotton fluffy batting stuff that acts as a breather material so there's somewhere for the air to escape through as you're sucking the vacuum down and provides the, you know, the, the, the opportunity for the epoxy to have a place to go, to go when it seeps out. So the whole point of this is that um, carbon fiber by itself and fiberglass by itself is flexible. It you know, doesn't do a whole lot of interesting stuff. You have to um, soak it thoroughly with epoxy to make the composite material that's where you get all the strength from. And there is sort of an optimal mix of epoxy to fiber um, to get the lowest weight, highest strength combination. And you can get very close to that optimal point using this kind of vacuum bagging technique. And the vacuum bagger cost me about 70 bucks US and the bagging material, you know, you can buy it in the grocery store in rolls. And so as long as I do parts that will fit within the 11 inch wide bags, good to go, cheap, fun, easy. Oh, and the only other trick is if you want it to stay flat, um, you put, you sandwich it between two uh, flat surface things and put a lot of weight on it to hold it flat while it's curing. Um, I'm using epoxy that will cure at room temperature so we don't have to deal with high temperatures. And this is what a part looks like when it comes out of the bagging material. I don't know how that looks but from back there, but it has a slightly pebbled look because of the fiberglass over top of the carbon fiber. It's actually very smooth. And because of the layer of fiberglass, I was able to sand it to be really smooth without sanding any of the carbon. So all of the strength of the carbon fiber was retained. And in effect, the, the fiberglass is sort of a sanding veil. And then this is what the three fins look like when they were attached to the phenolic body tube. And as you can see, I put a piece of fiberglass reinforcing across that center tube attaching the fins together. So in the end, this whole thing is incredibly strong. And the reason that's important is that this rocket was designed to and clearly did break Mach on the way up. And the <coughs> uh, forces that um, affect a rocket when it goes through the sonic transition region um, are most likely to want to rip your fins off. Okay, so I talked about the fact that, you know, making custom parts and building custom rockets is cool. Well, making motors is kind of cool too. <clears throat> um, sadly, I haven't gotten as far along in this part of the hobby as I thought I would have by now. It has to do with when the weather sort of unexpectedly turned really nasty a little earlier than usual in Colorado this year. But um, one of the things that, you know, I'm one of those people, I, I'm really enthusiastic about designing things and simulating them and understanding what's going to happen before I actually go and build stuff. I also sometimes like to just build things and see what happens. But when we're playing with stuff that can go boom or stuff that goes really, really fast, um, you know, the engineer in me wants to sort of, you know, understand what's going to happen ahead of time. So there are various programs out there for simulating the burn characteristics in a particular motor's grain geometry and uh, understanding what the pressure in the chamber is going to be and how much thrust you're going to get and all those sorts of things. 
but none of them were open source. And then um, several months ago, this fellow Mark Slabink showed up on one of the mailing lists um, saying that he'd written a motor simulator um, that if people wanted to play with it, here was a binary. I think he made them available for a couple of OSs, but there's certainly a binary made available for Linux. And I pulled the binary down and I played with it a little bit and went, oh, this is pretty cool. It actually does all the stuff that I think I'd want such a program to do, at least for now, in my naive motor building state. And then in an email discussion, he allowed us how, you know, if someone would write a GUI for it, then maybe he'd release the source code under the GPL. And I tried explaining to him on the mailing list that that seemed a little out of order to me. <clears throat> you know, that if he released the source code, maybe I'd get motivated to go find someone who'd be willing to work on a GUI. But he was absolutely stuck in his mind that the quid pro quo for releasing the source code is that someone else who understand how to do GUIs had to write a GUI for it so that people who are coming from a Windows background, you know, might actually want to use it. Um, never mind that, you know, you can write a make file that runs this simulator just beautifully and makes people like me really happy. So fortunately, my buddy Keith agreed to be the guy who would write such a GUI. And uh, while I've had him a little bit distracted recently on another project we'll talk about in a minute, um, he has acquired the source code to the burn simulator and uh, intends to deliver a Debian package once the GUI's up and we've met the commitment that you know, Mark expects in exchange for releasing the source code. And it's actually pretty cool. It uses an XML input uh, format. And yes, um, one of the reasons we got into this whole discussion about the source code is I noticed the typos in you know, his English spelling you know, not being perfect. And uh, he didn't want to fix it because it was going to be too much work. And I said, oh, I'd be happy to patch that. And he said, well, I don't want to convert my data files. And I said, it'd be no problem to make it so it'll accept the wrong spelling too. And that sort of led down this hole, but I'm not going to give you the source code unless somebody writes a, uh, a GUI. But as you can see here, the top line, it's specifying a particular propellant chemistry. In this case, it's the combination of potassium nitrate and erythritol. Erythritol is an alcohol sugar that has some interesting casting properties. It sort of goes from liquid to solid without a big volume reduction and sticks well to the inside of cardboard liner tubes and things like that. And then the uh, length of the uh, rocket's motor casing interior and its inside diameter. Um, then down here, the grain definition is specifying the geometry of the grains, which are sort of cylindrical sections. One of the things that you learn when you're playing with um, designing rocket motors is that the amount of chamber pressure and the amount of thrust that's being generated is proportional to the surface area that's burning at any given moment. And so the problem is that if you just take a single cylinder that's got a core up the center and you know it's confined on the outside and so forth, so it's only burning from the inside out, you have a problem because as it burns, it's a progressive burn. The surface area gets bigger and bigger until it gets out to the end and you're done. And so that means that it would start out with a T90 little bit of thrust and it would just push harder and harder and harder as it burned. Well, this is not very efficient. It's certainly not optimal and it doesn't lead to smooth flights. It also poses this question of will you have enough starting thrust to get the rocket off the rail and up to a stable speed quickly. So. The hack on this is that some dude named Bates discovered a bunch of years back that if you cut the cylinder into sections and inhibit the outside but allow it to burn not only in the inside surfaces but at the interfaces between the grains, that the surface area of the little donut shaped pieces on the ends of the grains will be going down as it burns at about the same rate as the inside is getting bigger. It turns out the optimal ratio of the length to diameter of the grains is about 1.6 to 1. So it turns out that almost every real solid-fueled rocket motor that you ever see uses this sort of a grain design to try and even out the uh, performance of the motor through the entire burn. In fact, the NASA's space shuttle solid rocket boosters are actually made out of stacked grains. And back when the Challenger tragedy occurred, it's because there was a failure of the gasketing at the junction between a pair of grains. So in the end, you know, as I said, this is sort of the way you do this to make a reasonably performing motor. And the syntax in here is really quite straightforward. You define the geometry of the grain, tell it how many there are, and it then goes off and simulates it and gives you all this you know, interesting stuff right here in numerical format 
Um, the important numbers that we look at are this thing called Kn, which is a factor describing the ratio of the burn surface area to the surface uh, area of the nozzle's throat, which gives you um, an easier to compare between no motors and easier number to intellectually uh, think about than things like chamber pressure, which varies a lot between motors. And in the end, this tells me that this particular motor design would be what we call an H129. So it's a motor that's in the H rock, uh, category. Um, and in fact, it tells me here that it's 78.61% of an H. As you, as you can think about it, if each letter is sort of a doubling, as you get to bigger and bigger letters, the amount of range that's covered by what means an H or what means an M motor gets to be pretty big. And so this is a way of telling sort of how far along from the smallest possible H to the largest possible H you are. And then the 129 means that its average thrust is 129 newtons. But of course, you know, this is sort of summaries and averages. It'll also plot it. This particular motor is not a totally wonderful design. Those curves could be a little bit flatter. But I actually picked this one because it's not as boring as the others that I've been designing that actually have nice flat curves. So anyway, um, I'm kind of excited. This is an interesting example of you know, one of the gaps where, until this year, um, all of the software that was available for playing around in this admittedly sort of esoteric little corner of the rocketry hobby has been proprietary software. And I think sometime in 2009, we'll be to the point where we have a completely usable, completely published, packaged, available in Debian and so forth um, simulator for simulating the burn characteristics of different propellants and high-powered rocket motors. So that leads to sort of the next step. Okay, so you pour some grains, make some motors, how are you going to test them? Um, chances are good that your first couple aren't going to be, you know, great. And so do you really want to put a rocket at risk? Even more importantly, do you want to put the spectators at a launch attended by other people at risk? So there's this whole concept of static motor testing, where you build a motor and you mount it to a test stand that has the ability to measure the thrust and or the chamber pressure, and you gather data, and you look to see whether the performance of the motor is at all like what you thought it would be and what your intuition and simulation said it would be. Well, most of the folks in this hobby end up using commercial data acquisition gear, particularly the little modules from um, Daytac and, and companies like that. But, you know, it's not real satisfying. In particular, the software that knows how to talk to them is pretty much all Windows. The Daytac folks have actually been very good in the sense that they've made um, enough information available that there is a Linux driver that will talk to some of their cheapest data acquisition units. But the one I was personally particularly interested in, if I went that route, didn't have driver support. And I don't know, I just was annoyed enough that I hadn't sort of decided what I was going to do yet. When along came this uh, young guy in Belgium who uh, came up on one of the, the uh, motor design lists and said that he designed this little board with a pick using its A to D converter uh, to gather data through an amplifier that he designed from the sensors. Um, and that he was, you know, you could go look at the design on his website, feel free to copy it, and by the way, he hid GPL, the firmware for it. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I went and looked at his website, and there was no assertion at all about what rights he felt he had over the hardware. So I had a conversation with him, and in the end, he agreed that, you know, he would love for other people to do derivative things with this, and so he has licensed his hardware design under the Tapper Open Hardware License which is a license that attempts to do for hardware designs the same thing the GPL does for software designs. So that was actually pretty exciting to me. And in the uh, naming schema that all of our projects seem to be falling into, um, this thing that I'm calling static metrum is a derivative of uh, Steeman's design that mostly just has a different analog amplifier because the approach he used is a little fiddly to get set up and there are better single chip solutions out there that I happen to know about. Unfortunately, I didn't quite get a chance to test this before the weather turned bad. And it's not that burning rocket motors in the snow is a bad idea. In fact, it could be a really good idea. If the motor goes boom and there's flaming propellant flying all over the place, a little snow might be a good thing. It's that you can't melt the component materials to create the stuff that you use to cast the grains when it's cold and expect to actually get good grains out of it. So 
I'm kind of waiting for, uh, and, and you don't do this in the house? <laughs> I've had some thoughts about taking one of the sheds that's an outbuilding on my property and putting a heater with a long extension. Whoops, there we go. And uh, warming the shed up enough to do this in the shed, but um, I don't know, something about casting propellant grains in confined spaces just not such a great idea. Yeah, with a heater going nearby, just... <laughs> So anyway, this is the little circuit board I hacked together. I just did this one with through-hole parts and you know point-to-point -point wiring. That's the business side. This is what it looks like mounted in a little aluminum box. It's just a PIC 18F 2550, um, programmable with the small devices C compiler, which is open source. I've got room on the left for two of the amplifier chips. I've only populated one now for the load cell, but I'm planning to do chamber pressure at some point too. And this is what the other end looks like switch and a USB cable. This is the little static test stand I welded together. Um, that's a two inch square piece of tubing, so that's what 50-ish millimeter square tube. Um, and the thing up on top is the load cell. This is a commercial load cell. Um, load cells are basically um, transducers that convert applied force into a change in the resistance of certain elements in a bridge. Um, you can kind of think of it as making an analog voltage out that's proportional to the force applied. Um, it's actually quite possible to make uh, transducers, but um, when I discovered that really, really good ones could be had for about 25 or 30 bucks a piece on eBay in the U.S., I just quit thinking about that. This is one of the interesting little hacks. It turns out this particular load cell had uh, quarter 20 threaded holes at the business end. And so I went and got a quarter 20 threaded carriage bolt that has a rounded over top. And this will give me a wonderfully repeatable single point of contact between the front end of the rocket motor, which will be pushing down on this, um, and the load cell so that the distance out along the lever arm should be the same every time. Um, and that vertical post that's in the stand is designed to have different size pieces of uh, PVC plastic pipe strapped to it that you then set the motor down through so it's free to move, um, and yet the nozzle's up, the front end's down, you therefore are measuring the thrust of it pushing down against the earth, which helps to ensure it's not gonna get, a, get away from you and you know, cause a problem. It keeps the orbit nice and circular, yes. <clears throat> so as I said, I haven't had a chance to actually try this yet. I have played games with it. Um, I had my son stand on the load cell and you know could measure his weight and things like that, but. This particular load cell is good for 75 kilograms. I also now have a 500 kilogram load cell, planning for bigger motors in the future. Okay, so I showed you the commercial altimeter board that I used for my highest confirmed altitude flight. Um, and I mentioned that I got a little distressed about it. Well, the problem is that these commercially available Altimeter boards for use in the high-powered rocketry hobby are all completely proprietary. Um, you know, the documentation is all about how to use it. It doesn't really talk much about how it works. You certainly don't get schematics or source code for the firmware. There's therefore no real ability to modify the behavior. Um, life's too short for reverse engineering tiny little things like this, particularly when you like to design stuff. So. I started looking around and I have discovered since last year that there are some really good designs out there being done by other people who are also interested in sort of pursuing non-commercial solutions. But frankly, they're being done by people who don't quite sort of get what it means to have an open design and to publish it in a way that other people can actually use and collaborate with. They're really nice people and I've learned a lot from talking to them, but their designs typically aren't very well published. I couldn't actually even the guys who are in Colorado that are doing a really cool project who are very helpful and love to talk about their stuff when I see them in person, I have not yet figured out how I could possibly, you know, get one of their boards or build one up myself or something like that. And frankly, everybody else doing this stuff makes interesting choices and compromises in their design that I frankly just don't quite understand. I don't know why everybody in this hobby is still working with 5-volt parts. I don't understand why they all think big honking 9-volt you know, batteries are the right battery technology. Um, there's just lots of, you know, why is everybody using TTL serial to talk to the boards? There's just lots of things that cause me to scratch my head. Because USB's hard, yeah, right. <clears throat>
just because you're having trouble getting the driver working. Um, so last year, the key element of the talk that I gave was this thing that I was working on, which is a completely open uh, altimeter design for dual deploy high powered rocketry use. And I called it Altus Metrum, and it was version 0.1. And somewhere in my bag here, I actually have the prototype, which I will happily pass around for you guys to take a look at while I'm talking. Let me find it here. That would be this one. So this is the board. You want to take a look at it and pass it around. I would like to have it back, please. But other than that, feel free. Um, so this is some of the design characteristics we had on it. Lots of aspirations of things we would do with it. I got to the point where um, code was running well on the board at um, in Melbourne last year on open day. Uh, we had folks playing around with the board, seeing that you know um, it did stuff. I had an eval board for the accelerometer that the kids were turning upside down and twisting around and seeing the accelerometer you know, change as gravity did its thing and all of that. But at some point, I managed to program myself into a corner where the board didn't want to work and didn't want to be reprogrammed. And I also discovered that you know, one of my aspirations for 2008 was to successfully pass the level three high power certification. And when I got to talking to the guy who's going to be my advisor, he said, well, if you want to fly one of those as a, just a passenger on this flight, that's fine. But you can't use it for a certification flight because the rules say that you have to use known, good, working stuff for certification flights. They are, after all, kind of dangerous. And so that sort of meant that I wasn't really going to be able to use this board in the way I'd hoped to use it on my own certification flight. So I just put the project aside for a little while. This is what the board looks like that's coming around. Um, it's about 20 some millimeters wide and what was that, four inches? It's 100 millimeters or so long. Nine volt battery connector hanging off of it for scale. You know, mini USB connector down here. That's the back side. This had a big honking ARM7 based uh, NXP chip on there, the LPC2148. Um, straightforward to program with uh, GCC. Um, GDB remote debugging over the JTAG interface was working, all that kind of stuff. And I had plans for doing a, a version 0.2, and the biggest things that I was looking at, um, I actually took some grief in the session at LCA last year about the fact that I hadn't spent enough time looking at LiPo battery technology, that super light batteries, high power density batteries of the lithium polymer variety had gotten better, and the chips for controlling them had gotten easier, and I really ought to go look at those. Um, and then we also really wanted to get around to integrating a GPS receiver and RF link because, as I mentioned, I'd had this experience where um, flying really high in May last year made it absolutely clear that knowing where the rocket was when it touched down would have been, you know, hugely valuable. Then this funny thing happened. Keith and I were at a conference together last fall. We both had these little RF tracking transmitters we'd gotten from a very nice company. Uh, called Big Red B in Oregon. Uh, it makes this little thing called a B-Line that's basically a PIC processor and a little TI transmitter chip. But we were trying to figure out how could we use one of those for the downlink on the Altus Metrum V0.2 board. And we realized that there are a couple of things that he'd done that were a little challenging on the board. So we, I actually, in my schematic capture tools, captured a clone, more or less, of the B-Line board and started hacking on it. And, we were making good progress and talking to each other you know, over meals at this conference and so forth. And then a mutual friend walked up and showed us a cool little board he was working on using a newer version of a part in that same series of TI ChipCon chips that integrates a CPU and an RF subsystem, a full duplex transceiver, not just a transmitter. And they're only about seven bucks in quantity one. And we sort of looked at it and went, that's kind of cool. Before long, we had decided that for very little more effort, ha, 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 than designing the beacon board, we could actually completely change the design of the altimeter board and end up with an altimeter board that also had an RF link built into it. And so thus was born this thing I've been calling Telemetrum, which is you know, a lot like last year's altimeter board, but with a much less gutsy processor going from an ARM7 to an 8051 is probably one of the bigger 
things about this. Much smaller memories, but it's still got USB, still got lots of I.O. Um, as Keith pointed out, I have successfully managed to consume every I.O. pin on the part doing something interesting. Um, but one of the changes that we made is we did put full uh, lithium polymer battery support in, and there's actually sort of a standardized two millimeter connector that various folks are using for lithium polymer batteries now. So the nice thing is the way lithium polymer batteries work is they're all sort of single cell 3.7 volt batteries. And the way I've designed this, you really can sort of plug in however many milliamp hours worth of battery you want. If it's a little rocket and it's gonna be easy to find, you put a little battery on it. If it's a big honking rocket and you really care about finding it again, even if it takes weeks, you put a really big battery on it. And um, the charging circuit should be completely happy. So this is the little TI ChipCon part. Um, that's actually a inkjet printed copy of the artwork for the top layer of the PC board with the reference designators. And I was sticking this down on it before I sent the board out for fab to make sure that it works. That part is, I don't know, it's six millimeters on an edge or something. It's not very big. It's got 36, quote, pins, unquote. There's actually no protruding stuff on this at all. It's just flat pads on the bottom of the chip. So soldering them down, it's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to giving it a try shortly. Yes? Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> I don't intend to go boom. Um, we'll see what happens, but the goal, of course, is to design this, build it, fly it as a secondary altimeter on a bunch of flights until we're confident in it, and then we'll put the really big scary rockets on it and see what happens. Um, and then I did the same thing. That's the barometric pressure sensor up in the top that's sort of shiny with a metal top and a hole in it. The part to the left of that is the, it's the yeah, it's 128K by 8 non-volatile memory part, and this is the 50G accelerometer down here. Oh, the other thing is on the previous design, I'd use this cute little three-axis accelerometer. It's like, oh, this will be fun. We can learn all sorts of things. And then I started looking at designing motors, and I was going, you know, wow, 6G. That's a little tiny motor. Um, so if we're going to characterize the kind of motors that I actually want to play with and that Keith wants to play with and some of our mutual friends in the hobby would like to play with, much higher acceleration values are likely to be needed. So this particular part footprint, um, I've selected a 50G part as the default, but we can have anything from 40G to 200G in a part that fits in that same footprint. The little part down below, it's a voltage converter because that's the only part on the board. That accelerometer is the only part on the board that doesn't run at 3.3 volts. So we did a four-layer PC board design and sent it out. And yet another cool hack, there's a uh, service where you can get four-layer boards done for 66 bucks each if you will do at least four boards. And if you do four, they'll give you a fifth one free. And the limits are surface area on the board. So by laying up a panel of 10 of my T9C little boards, we actually were able to get 50 raw boards for four times 66 bucks plus shipping, which makes this all sort of affordable. <laughs> this is what one of the boards looks like. In fact, I have one of the raw boards with me. I'll start passing this around too. Marvel and behold the T9C little parts. Um, on the previous board that's going around, I used the largest commonly available footprint size for the passive components like resistors and capacitors. It's called a 1206, which is 120 by 60 mils or thousandths of an inch. These parts are 0402s, which means 40 by 20 mils. They're my wife's comment on seeing what 100 of them looked like after I'd stripped them off of the carrier material and put them in a little prescription medicine bottle is that I could easily lose those in the spoonful of sugar I put in a cup of coffee in the morning. So they're really tiny and they're going to just be lots of fun to put on. The most exciting part of this design is the footprint for the processor chip, which you see has that sort of checker um, tic-tac-toe board design. We work it out to its 40, 48 separate pieces of geometry to make up that ground pad underneath and get the solder masking and all that stuff right. It's very interesting playing with the tools trying to make that work. 
and this is the back side of the board. This board is interesting because all of the parts are on one side of the board. And the reason for doing that is I'm planning to use the electric skillet method of reflow soldering, where you use a stencil to put solder paste down on the top, stick all the parts down where they should go, put the bar board on a piece of aluminum heat spreading material in an electric skillet, crank it up and use an infrared non-contact thermometer to watch the temperatures. You bring it up, hold it at the right level for a while, take it the rest of the way up and hit the right thermal curve for the solder paste that you're using. Wish me luck. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, so the, 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 the cool thing about using reflow stuff is that even these teeny tiny little parts, if you get them anywhere near in the right place in the solder paste, surface tension in the solder paste will actually pull them into alignment on the pads beneath. That's part of the reason we had to go to a higher spec PC board process. As you look at these coming around, these are obviously a better board with more features on the actual board's construction than last year's because without the solder resist layer and so forth, this kind of reflow soldering is much more difficult. So also important to us is that all the tools that we have used for this whole project are as open source as they can possibly be. Julie? <laughs> Um, so all the parts we've bought are Rojas compliant. Um, and in fact, is this, I don't remember if the paste that I bought is or not because it's actually much easier to solder with good solder, but um, life's like that. Um, right, so yeah, so the, the, the key here is that I'm using the same design tool chain that I used in the past except that instead of a GCC derived compiler suite, um, the work this time around is being done in SDCC. This is probably the single most important tool in this whole project, which is the uh, trinocular inspection microscope that my wife and kids bought me for Christmas a couple of years ago. Um, I have to tell you that even trying to look at the part sitting on the paper printout of the top layer, I was under the microscope trying to see it. Just a couple of folks have noticed I'm now saddled with reading glasses, you know, not as young as I used to be. And, like this tool a lot. So software, um, yay Keith. Keith volunteered to write the firmware for this for me. Yep, thanks. Um, as he likes to put it, you can tell he works for somebody that makes chips. Starting from sand, he now has C source debugging on an 8051 working over the three wire debug port using the small devices C compiler. The only non clearly open source piece in this whole project right now is that it turns out, I discovered to my dismay last year, because it's also a dependency for the GNU radio stuff, that the 8051 assembler is one of several assemblers in the SDCC package that's not actually open source. It got incorporated with one of those sort of quirky, quasi, free for non-commercial use kind of licenses. And so SDCC has mostly been tossed out of Debian Maine. <coughs> um, I helped to split the package, so all the parts that could be are still in Maine, but unfortunately the part we need isn't. Uh, fortunately, Upstream knows about this, and there's a lengthy process underway to try and get that all resolved. It sounds like we're on a path to a solution, but I don't know. I'm not going to talk much about the software. That sounds like an excellent subject for another presentation by Keith. You know, Keith talking about something other than X? I suppose it could happen. I did want to mention, again, you know, the licenses for all of the design stuff we're doing are completely open. We're using the Tapper open hardware license and all of the software and firmware stuff is GPL v2 or later. Yours is v2 only. Okay, well, <coughs> that works too. Um, okay, so this is my first level three certification attempt rocket. Um, this flew in October in the Pawnee National Grasslands at the other big annual event that Northern Colorado Rocketry runs called Oktoberfest. This is a full custom design. It's actually the one that you saw me constructing fins for earlier in the talk. It flew on an M-class motor and it's absolutely beautiful flight going up. Just really gorgeous. Unfortunately, the black and gold bits have not been recovered. All the parts that are red up there I got back. <laughs> so it turns out that that cute little 7995 uh, commercial dual deploy altimeter um, we found out afterwards has an admitted firmware bug. 
said firm, isn't this just wonderfully ironic? <laughs> said firmware bug may cause premature ejection of the main parachute in flights above 10,000 feet over ground level. This rocket hit Mach 1.36 on the way to about 16,000 feet. That's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> the problem is um, it had not one but two RF tracking transmitters and they were both in the payload bay behind the nose cone. And the design of this rocket was that it would deploy a drogue at Apogee and float itself down to about 1,500 feet above ground level, at which point it would fire another charge, which would separate it into two pieces, which would settle under separate parachutes. The reason for this is long and complex, and I won't bore you with the details, but it's called free bagging, and it's a technique that, in, turns out, is heavily covered in the literature and never used by anybody who's sane. So, um, you know, the idea was that if they're separating from each other fairly low to the ground, um, when we find the one with the tracking transmitter in it, the other one should be within sight, right? <laughs> well, when they separate from each other way up high on a day when there's a lot of high-level wind, we finally located the red bits uh, three and a half or four miles downrange from the launch site, and we have not yet discovered where the other parts went. This includes several friends with small planes flying over at low altitude looking for it and all that sort of stuff. This is the motor for that particular rocket. This is a 75 millimeter diameter motor uh, in the M class. That's me putting it together just before the flight. And that's what it looked like the last time we saw it. <laughs> yeah. it, it really was beautiful. Yeah, it really was. Uh, the, the angle on the right looks a little cockeyed, but I think it's because of where the person was standing watching it go up. It just, well, it's beautiful. I'm confident the launch will make the uh, Northern Colorado Rocketry hi Video Highlights DVD this year, but... So, you know, my wife, after listening to me grouse about this for a couple weeks, said, you know, the only way you're ever going to feel better about this is just build another rocket and go try again. <laughs> I do love this woman. Um, <clears throat> so this was the next thing I built, um, and we successfully flew this for a Level 3 certification on the 15th of November at a different site in Colorado, this one down south of where I live. This is actually started as a kit. It was highly modified, got carbon fiber internal reinforcements and tip-to-tip -tip glassing on the fins and all that sort of thing. It was completely successfully recovered despite the fact that there was a deployment issue on this one as well. Uh, this one is a design issue, not something that I did wrong or something that was wrong in the electronics. Um, it re did result in the main being deployed at Apogee and so it came all the way down on the big chute. But Oh, and it turns out that due to an issue with the design calculator provided by the guys who designed the parachute that my wife helpfully agreed to sew for me, um, it came down at about 30 feet per second instead of 20 feet per second. So it hit kind of hard, and the little nylon straps holding the batteries in place in the avionics bay snapped when it hit the ground. But that in no way diminished the successful recovery, so I successfully achieved a level three certification, and we get to you know, do lots more of this again in the future. That's what it looked like going up with Pike's Peak in the background. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. In fact, there are two little funny stories about this. We had just gotten the rocket mounted on the launch rail, and we're walking back up to the control area to get ready to launch it, and a police car came flying in the entry road. And one of the guys walking with me said, we should probably hold off a minute and see what he wants before we light this off. <laughs> Well, it turns out he was supposed to be running a radar speed trap about a mile and a half up the road, but somebody told him we were about to launch a big rocket, and he wanted to come watch. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that it was really good that he did, because since the main chute came out at Apogee, it did drift a little bit farther than anticipated and set down across the highway that goes by this particular launch site on a rancher's land. Turns out the rancher is the cop's uncle. So, 
it's kind of nice having a police escort into the property of the person that your rockets landed on to go recover. But anyway. And this is what it looked like when it sat down. Everything was in great condition. So that's pretty much it, except that I'd love to show you the video of that launch. Do we have time to do that before we wrap up? <laughs> yes, I will hold them up to the speaker. Let me actually run the volume all the way up first. It will sound really gnarly because it's a PC speaker, but you know, here we go. I'm not going to try and figure that out. If you want to show me how to do it, we'll come back later and do it again. Yeah, other people have commented that that's the perfect like embodiment of an Acme rocket. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see there it is the shoots out at Apogee. And it's drifting down, and there's lots of commentary in the background, people laughing about how quickly it left the rail. That's one of the ejection charges that should have put the main out. And here comes the backup charge. So actually, the guy that you know was my sort of certifying officer in this whole process was totally thrilled. He's like, everything you did worked exactly right, except you believed the kit manufacturer's instructions on this one thing that you really shouldn't have. <clears throat> Here's what you should do differently to change that little bit of the design before you fly it again. So it, uh, it satisfied everybody. Um, how far away was that? Just over a quarter of a mile. M might have actually been about a third of a mile. I don't know, certainly less than a kilometer away. It was not very windy that day, which I'm very fortunate for, because it turns out the rules of all of this basically say that if it had gone outside of the approved launch area, that the cert would have failed. In other words, you have to land back within the area that the altitude waiver has been cleared for. It went to just shy of 6,000 feet in elevation. The waiver was 8,000 feet, so that was all great. Everybody was happy. Life is good. As you can see, I'm just having a blast playing around with all sorts of cool open source things in and around the rocketry hobby, and I'm going to be doing lots more this year. Yeah. How much? Oh, my board. My board is smaller than any of the commercial boards I've seen that do anything like what it does. It's um, 25 by 65 millimeters or something. The new, yeah, the new one. Um, it's it's very small and cost-wise, it sh the, the materials cost is about the same as one of the off-the-shelf altimeters plus one of the off-the-shelf RF beacons and it will do so much more cool stuff. In fact, there's lots of non-rocketry things you could do with that board. I'm sure other people will come up with cool ideas. Um, as you saw in here, all of the design information is already up. You can go pull down the schematics and PC board artwork and all that stuff if you'd like to. Thank you very much for your time and attention.